ambiguity if you don't really know what you're doing or have the time to kind of work it out. So we can confirm it really quick and dirty with what we refer to as a field test or field, F-I-E-L-D test, um, that works out really well if you kind of follow the program. And I'll give you a handout a little bit later that will help you through this. But you basically take the soil, put it in your hand, moisten it, kind of make mud pies out of it. You squeeze it between your thumb and your forefinger and see if you can extrude it. And over time they figured out that if it stains the fingers or if it's rough and gritty or it doesn't form a ribbon or the ribbon is mm long, then <laughs> you can actually get down to these classifications here at least, maybe not as much as the soil texture triangle, but at least you've got sand, loamy sand, sandy loam, sandy silt loam, all the way down to silty clay, and then clay as well. So it actually does a pretty good job if you just sort of follow the key, and we'll work through that later on, and that will confirm what your texture class is. And again, we want to know that at least if it's fine, medium, or coarse, we can at least say that about a soil. It's going to influence our irrigation, how we water it, how often, how many minutes we can run our cycles. And um, friends, I'm not sure why I have a blank there, but um, probably to ask you a question, which soil texture do you think is going to have a shorter run time? In other words, fewer minutes. Yeah, the clay would be. You can actually get runoff on a clay soil within about two to three minutes. So I know they always say, oh, set your timer for 10 minutes, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, that's way too much if your soil is fine textured or mostly clay. Add a slope to that, and it's like a disaster. So you really need to be careful. Now, if you have a sandy soil or one that drains really quickly, 10 minutes might be appropriate for that. And there's actually some nice calculators online that will ask you questions like, okay, where do you live, you know, what's your zip code, what's your soil texture, what kind of irrigation equipment do you have, and you can just kind of punch that information, and, oh, and what kind of crop you're growing, will actually give you a schedule, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to talk about irrigation in another week here, but it will actually give you a schedule that's based on your soil texture and what you're growing and what your equipment is, which is all the factors you have to do to do a, a decent irrigation <laughs> schedule. Now, um, it also is going to affect the soil amendments that you're going to be using. So any additives like sulfur or lime, um, again, sometimes even different <laughs> nutrients, anything that might interact with the soil, herbicides I mentioned, um, gypsum, other things, it's going to depend on the texture of your soil, and usually there's going to be a higher quantity for clay than there is for sandy soil. Why do you think that is? Surface area. Surface area, one big thing, but it actually it turns out not only that, but clay also has a chemical component to it that also attracts. It's usually there are negatively charged particles, clay particles, and they actually attract positively charged <coughs> nutrient ions. Organic matter is the same way. It's also negatively charged and also attracts positively charged ions. So if you have high amounts of organic matter or high amounts of clay, your pound rate is going to increase. So keep that in mind as you're reading some of the different charts. Um, this might be a little difficult to read, but what this does is tells you how much water is actually in the soil at various, for various textures at the various um, points. And so we mentioned, and, and I think in your reading you saw what field capacity is. Anybody give me a definition of that? Maybe if we start with saturation, that's easier. <laughs> when does saturation occur in a soil? Yeah, when all the pores are filled with water and you can't add any more water to it. Okay, That's kind of our basic definition of saturation. It might happen if you irrigated too long or if we had really wet, rainy weather. Uh -huh, three months. Um, our soils could become saturated. Okay? Now, after a bit of time, within about 24 to 48 hours, that water will drain out by the force of gravity, or a certain amount of water will. 
and what the state of being that the soil is in after that gravitational water has left is called field capacity. So it's not saturated, but it's at that ideal point where gravity took over, got rid of all the excess water, and it's like just that perfect ideal state we talked about before. Not too much water, not too much air. At least for that moment in time, it's called field capacity. Yeah. In my neighborhood, which is La Costa, uh -huh. uh, up on the ridge there, they uh, the landscapers use jackhammers ah. to put in <laughs> even just a bush. Um, so it's it's not a bit rock, but it is absolutely the, su the subsoil is yeah, it's, DJ, it's hard as a rock. It's like concrete. It's probably sandstone. So mm -hmm. in terms of field capacity. I mean, your water is coming down, but it, it really just drains from 18 to 24 inches. Drains quickly? Is that what you're saying? Yes, it drains okay. well. It, mm -hmm. It's draining quickly, but then it sits there. Oh, okay. What do you do? Or I, first of all, I guess in terms of field capacity, mm. the drainage really doesn't. That's not happening. Gravity doesn't. Gravity is not allowing it to. Oh, because it hits a, right. a pan and then yeah. it just sits It'll there. It'll evaporate, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping, right? Right. I'm, I'm yeah. there. Or it, it depends on if it, if it is, it may slide off if there's a bit of a slope and there's a hard right. pan. Right. You can, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, then you've got a bathtub. <laughs> it's tons of pleasure. So does any of this then pertain to that? Or? Well, it's what's being held in the soil, but if you have a perched water table or if the water is being held artificially, in there, then yeah, that's maybe only the top six inches are going to reach field capacity. The rest of it's, you know, going to be saturated longer. It'll take a while before it gets to its field capacity. Yes. I have the same problem. Mm -hmm. I have a solution. To see if this makes sense. If you add more bulk, if you added more soil above where mm -hmm. the water sits, mm -hmm. and you put more amendments in there to allow for draining. Mm -hmm. And if the roots only go back go down about six or eight inches, they're not going to hit with that water. Is, is, is that an appropriate remedy? For that? That's probably true. Yeah. So, and sometimes doing a raised bed is the best thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So basically, what this is saying is, when you have a sandy soil versus a loam soil versus a silty clay loam, at field capacity, there's actually slightly more water in the sandy clay loam soil than there is in the loam, and a lot more water being held than there is at, in the sandy soil. So at field capacity, it means different things for different types of soils. Okay? The wilting point occurs here at 1.6 inches in sand, 1.8 inches for the loam, but about 2.6 for this. And this is actually, look at over here in the sand, this would actually be field capacity for the sand, but for this silty clay loam, it's actually the wilting point. So what this is just saying is that these soils hold more moisture. Tightly held around those surface areas. So the good news is, is it's got surface area, it's holding water, but the water is unavailable. Because all of this water, this lower area below the wilting point, is what we refer to as unavailable water, or hygroscopic water, it's sometimes called because it's held so tightly to the soil particles that the roots physically cannot exert enough energy to get it off. Now, let's see, I did forget one thing today, and I don't know if anybody could come up with a bucket or a bowl that I could put some water in. I got a bucket. Do you? Yes. Good. Thank you. Wow. I've got some water. Awesome. Good. Okay. <laughs> always Yeah, anybody got a sponge? <laughs> 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 All right. 
right. Well, instead of a sponge, I guess we'll use this. Uh, it's not ideal. Typically, this demonstration is done with a sponge. But if you can imagine me just getting this thing all full of water. Okay. So it's saturated. But it is dripping water. And what this is right now, this is like the gravitational water. The power of gravity is extracting this water. So it's very loosely held by the soil. Water, you can and it's to the point where it's draining away. And pretty soon, it's going to stop. And you can do this with a sponge at home. That kind of demonstrates it. So it's actually stopping. And when it stops, this is what we refer to as field capacity. Okay, it's still very wet, but there's enough kind of air spaces in there for the plant roots to get oxygen. There's moisture for the plant, and it can go for a long, long time until it actually either the water evaporates or the soil roots extract all the water out of there. Now, let's just say my squeezing it is the plant roots working on it, getting the water out over time, maybe some evaporation using the water, and it gets to a point where it's getting harder and harder for those plant roots to get the water. Okay? So we're reaching a point now where it's just impossible for them to get it off, and it's called the wilting point. Now, is it wet? Yeah. It's still got a lot of moisture in it. Okay? This is all that unavailable water. So even though it's wet, it's held on so tightly the plant roots cannot get it. So at this point, the plant is going to wilt. It's going to start collapsing, suffering. It just can't support itself without that available water. So this is the area, then, that we refer to as plants having no stress, maybe a little bit of stress. But if you can imagine an irrigation system, when do you want to turn the system on again? Yeah, before it gets into stress, probably. Now, if you're maybe growing grapes and you want to get that good flavor out of it, maybe a little stress is not so bad, so it depends on your crop. But if you want to keep your plants, like, really happy, um, and they always say that plants without stress attract fewer of those borers that Julia was talking about, try to keep the plants healthy, avoid stress. If you're growing a crop, you get really good production. The bugs are less likely to start coming in and causing problems. So you want to definitely not keep it saturated, but you want to keep it somewhere between field capacity and the wilting point. And so we actually do have soil sensors now that you can set up in your soil. You can tell it what your soil texture is, and it knows how to read that information and then kick on your irrigation system when it gets to that point. And so soil moisture sensors then are a good tool for your irrigation controller to help you know when to turn it on. Otherwise, we might use um, weather-based irrigation controllers that will kick it on after it sort of calculates and says, well, it's been sunny and windy, and the days are this long, so by now it's probably evaporated or used up all the water, time to kick on again. And it can actually do a custom weather-based um, controlling situation for your irrigation system. And again, a key bit of information you're going to put into those is what your soil texture is. Because it knows that the amount of water being held in a sandy soil is going to be different from that silty clay loam or the clay soil. So they're pretty smart about these things. Now, um, another thing that's kind of interesting <coughs> with soils, if you have point source irrigation, like if you have emitters, Maybe that new inline drip tubing that's pressure compensated, Netafim or some of the other manufacturers, Hunter, are making those. Um, yeah, let's see what I did with my pointer here. Oops. If you have a clay soil, because of those fine, tiny particles and pore spaces, when the water hits the surface, it actually takes a long time for it to go down because it's spending a lot of time filling up those little spaces and going laterally. Compared to the sandy soil, large pore spaces, the force of gravity is really pulling that down. 
So you can imagine then your spacing of your emitters. You usually have choices like 12 inch spacing, 18 inch spacing, 24 inch spacing, or whatever. You will probably want to have closer together spacing for the sandy soil and wider spacing for the clay soil. So again, when you're designing a drip irrigation system, you need to keep that in mind. Also maybe for how many minutes you run it, you don't want to have this getting too far down, you know, the, the water kind of running all the way down and irrigating areas that maybe aren't being used by the plants. You don't want to waste water either. So knowing that information about your soil texture and how soil or the water tends to move in the soil naturally is going to be really important to know. So again, all we know all of this just because of the texture of the soil, which is the relative amount of sand, silt, and clay, which tells us kind of what we're dealing with as far as you know the predominant size pore spaces in there. Obviously, it's a mixture of sizes, but this gives us at least um, something to work with. Okay, so let's say you have lousy texture. It's way too much sand, or it's way too much clay, and you want to kind of bring it back in balance. And you know those three components, sand, silt, and clay. And you might think, hmm, if I've got too much clay, if I just can add sand to it, I'll bring it back into balance and I'll get those nice big pore spaces. Or maybe it's too sandy, you go, man, I could just add some more clay. Where can I go buy clay? I'm going to put clay in there, mix it up, and I'll, you know, make my situation better. What do you think you've just done, cement? Yeah, cement, adobe, bricks, whatever. <laughs> Not a good plan. Okay, fortunately there is an answer, something else. And what is that something else? Yes. Yeah. Organic matter. Yeah, our big motto in soil science is, when in doubt, add organic matter. It usually seems to solve the problem in both directions more economically, more easily without creating a lot of problems. Organic matter is typically easier to purchase, it's easy to transport, easy to work into a soil, and then even if you kind of put too much in, it'll break down and then um, you know it'll kind of rectify itself there a little bit better. But it adds so much to a soil, not only physical, capabilities and water holding capacity and some chemical um, attributes as well, but it also contributes nutrients and, and other good things, maybe some new microbes into the soil which are beneficial. Yes? I guess the, the, the thing that strikes me here is why wouldn't your first question be what kind of plants like what you have? Oh, very good, very I mean, good. Yeah. Why are we, you know, that's... Mm -hmm. If I why are we horticulturists so, so idealistic? Right. Why, why do we want to try to grow gardens? everything? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, we do. <laughs> um, you know, so if you have your heart set on blueberries and they need perfect drainage, you know, give it up. Or build a special raised bed or a container that you just amend just for blueberries or something like that. So know your crop. Know, you know, either, you know, be happy and live with what you have. Manage it. Maybe improve it a little bit. Or perhaps, you know, hey, if you have native soil and you see the native plants growing next to you, maybe that's a clue that you need to go with natives in your garden. But, again, people, you know, they want what they want. want to create a Frankenstein. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. So, again, you can add organic matter, which we said does kind of cure a lot of problems. Or you might look at structure. That's another physical property. Remember we said color, texture, structure? This is the third one that we want to take a look at because structure can actually help alleviate poor texture. So what is structure? Okay, so structure is how those individual particles aggregate together naturally because Guess what? You had to go through a lot of work to get your soils to separate into sand, silt, and clay. You might have had to add a chemical to it. You might have had to add, um, you know, a lot of physical force and shaking. Maybe you had to grind it up a little bit because it actually naturally holds together with um, organic matter, plant roots, clays. Actually, can kind of gel these things together. 
And so where you might have a lot of micropores, if they aggregate together in a clump, it might be creating some of those macropores. And I have to laugh at the guy that has the bucket full of rocks that he brought. <laughs> That's kind of what happened in your situation, is you had all those macropores being formed by rocks in there, which did allow the water to um, go through very quickly. So it forms these natural aggregates or PEDs, and these are um, holding sometimes the micropores, the tiny ones hold the water, and the larger ones hold the air spaces. So these are called PEDs or clods sometimes, and they can either be a certain shape or a certain size or a certain grade. So soil scientists do classify these structures. Again, you can see this up against the big pen. These are pretty good size clods. And they actually talk about them as being granular, platy, angular, blocky, subangular, prismatic, or columnar. And all of these are possible to be formed in your soil naturally. Now, typically, if, if you have, you know, really, whoops, sorry, did the wrong one again. If you have good things going on in the A horizon, you're going to typically have these granular structures, kind of like coffee grounds or, um, worm castings, that sort of thing. That's a really good kind of structural size that you could have. Um, sometimes if you have what's referred to as an e-horizon, you might get this platy. And this can actually be difficult to get water through because you've got layers or plates that have formed. And that might be kind of why your soil's not draining. It's possible. And so it has to kind of go you know, sideways to actually get through that. Down in the B horizon, we typically will have these um, angular, blocky, subangular, prismatic, and columnar forming. So again, it does help with the drainage in those um, situations. Hmm, let's see. This one. I'm actually not sure what we need to do to get it. Do Byron's other. So we do have some things that are called structureless soils. That would be like going to the beach where it's just all single grain. There's not really any structure there. Or if we have some that are just one big mass of soil. We would refer to those as also structureless. And you can destroy structure by walking on it when it's wet or driving over it with heavy machinery or t over tilling it too much, you can actually destroy any structure that might have built up. So you really do need to be careful um, to preserve the structure as much, much as possible. So we humans can do a lot to kind of mess that up. Again, as far as plants are concerned, we want that open, well-drained, well-aerated structure. Buildings and roads and foundations, we want it you know, compacted and kind of destroy it to a certain extent. So how do you improve structure? Anything that encourages plant growth or microorganisms, which sometimes are the, have the same needs, those are going to improve structure. Because actually the microbes do quite a bit to help form those aggregates. So if we have the pH that they like, if we have the amount of water that they like and the proper nutrients, they're happy and they're busy doing all that structural work for us. So we'll talk a little bit later about what pH range we want, and obviously we don't want it too wet, or we'll get the wrong kind of bacteria in there. They like oxygen as well, so the same thing your plant roots like, these microbes will like. And they also are hungry little guys, so they need some nutrition as well. So compaction results when you apply any kind of pressure to the soil. It's going to squish those pores, it's going to reduce any openness that you might have had. It could increase your erosion. It's going to harm your ability for water to infiltrate into that soil. And it's going to reduce percolation. And obviously, the end result is not enough oxygen for any plant or microbe to be happy. So visually, again, it's a non-compacted soil versus one that's been compacted. Again, either driven over walked over repeatedly, like on campus, you know, where students want to go from point A to point B, 
and they, you know, they don't care if there's no paving there, but little by little you'll see the grass wearing down and that soil is just like concrete, so they give up and pave it. <laughs> so. Okay, we're going to switch gears here a little bit to um, soil chemistry, because that's going to help a little bit um, in understanding how things go. And when we talk about chemistry, it's not so much the physical, but there's some actual chemical processes taking place that involve nutrients, pH, and fertilizers. So we'll start getting into that. So soil fertility is its ability to supply nutrients for plant growth. And you probably remember from your reading that there's 17 nutrients. I think when I was in school it was 16, and some books now say like 18 or 19. Um, it kind of depends. They've done more research, and certain plants have certain requirements. Um, but again, there's at least those 16 or 17 that I think most people agree on nowadays. And these are um, typically what we refer to as the macronutrients, the micronutrients, and then things we just refer to as those beneficial elements. Those are the ones that keep adding or subtracting from that original 16, sodium, silicon, and cobalt. Um, the macronutrients just mean they're needed in large quantities. So we've got things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, also hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. Those are also considered macronutrients. But we don't think about them in terms of like buying anything or fertilizer because those are just naturally present, typically in the atmosphere or in water. Um, secondary macronutrients also needed in large quantities, are still considered macro, are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. The micronutrients are needed in micro amounts, so don't overdo them. Um, a little goes a long way. And these are things like boron, copper, chlorine, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc. And if you overdo it, sometimes you can get a toxicity. Some plants are sensitive to these if the amount gets to be too much. Okay, so again, the nutrients, um, water is a really big one. That's going to give us our hydrogen and oxygen, and that actually makes up about 90% of the plant's weight. So water is really, really important. Not only that, it helps to dissolve and transport the other nutrients. So again, we've got the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, NPK, which stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, Manganese, calcium, and sulfur, and all of those nine up there are considered the macronutrients. Then we've got the rest of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or so, that are considered the micronutrients. Now, nutrients are usually used by plants in their ionic forms. In other words, they have to either have a positive charge as a cation or a negative charge as an anion. That is how they're actually taken up by plant roots and there's a little bit of an exchange that goes on and then they're also adsorbed or held on to those soil particles and the organic matter with those charges. It kind of holds them loosely there so that the plants can use them. So if you have The soil solution, which is just talking about, you know, the this, this soup, the water with dissolved ions in there. We've got organic matter and soil minerals that are kind of moving back and forth in that solution, both from the mineral part, the organic matter part, and then what we refer to as the soil colloids. And the soil colloids are anything that has a net negative charge, and that again is the clay and the organic matter. And so if they are positively charged ions, cations, they actually move back and forth in and out of that solution. So again, these are more chemical processes that are going on. You don't need to understand them completely. But do know that a root hair gives off a little bit of water sometimes, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and that kind of becomes a carbonic acid, so to speak. That's a negative um, that's being given off. And then also it gives off positively charged ions. And so when one goes in, another one comes out. So in other words, it's showing you here a calcium that has two positive charges goes in and 
two negatively charged hydrogen ions go out. Okay, so there's this constant exchange going back and forth. Here's the soil particle, negatively charged, holding on to potassium, calcium at two sites because it's a, a plus two ion. Again, potassium, magnesium is a plus two, etc. So soil particles can hold on to these positively charged ions and exchange them with the roots. So again, it's the humus, the organic matter part of the soil, and the clay part of the soil that actually have these negative charges that are effective in the cation exchange capacity. The more clay you have, the more organic matter you have, the more there is that capacity to hold those positively charged ions. Some of the positively charged ions are the good guys. Potassium, calcium, magnesium, okay. and some forms of nitrogen actually. So again, it's a <coughs> negative, positive attraction. And to the point where sometimes they're actually held on and they don't actually go anywhere in the soil. They're just held there for a while until something else comes, maybe that's heavier or stronger, element-wise, and kind of knocks them off. Now, there are the anions, um, the negatively charged nutrients, um, like nitrate, etc. cetera. Um, and these are negatively charged, and they're available through anion exchange. And sometimes that occurs on organic matter. Um, but if you've heard of nitrate pollution and how nitrates can be a problem, it's because it's a negatively charged ion. It's not held on to the clay and it's not held on to the organic matter. And so it's a problem when we water a lot or leach it, the nitrates leach out and they could end up you know, with nitrogen pollution in places that you might not want it. Now, this just kind of gets into a lot of details you probably don't need to know about, but certain types of clay minerals and organic matter um, have different amounts of charges on them, and so that can be um, affecting things depending on where you're, you are as far as you know, the part of the world, your parent material, what type of clay minerals are actually in there. Now, sources of soil fertility are those actual minerals, that parent material that made up your soil. So they actually supply a lot of stuff, not nitrogen, though. that has to come from somewhere else. And they actually, as that parent material is weathered, if you saw way back in the beginning, remember we looked at the, um, the sandy soil only really having iron, whereas the basalt and other things had a good mixture of all the different nutrients. So as they weather or break down, they release these nutrients into the soil <coughs> complex. So if your parent material wasn't very rich, you're not going to have naturally rich um, soil either. Now organic matter, though, is a really good source for nitrogen, um, a lot of the micronutrients. And as that organic matter breaks down, it releases these ions into the soil. Um, for plants to use. So that's one reason we really like organic matter. It's a, a good intermediate to long-term storage. Again, some are quick, some are slow. So you, you have to be patient with organic matter. So again, just kind of repeating there that it can be these um, colloids are a good source of holding on to that nutrient and keeping it there until the plant actually needs it. Okay, so that's just a little bit about how those interact in the soil. Another concept we need to, to um, take a look at, and we'll be looking at this later this afternoon as we test our soils for pH, is the term pH, which kind of roughly stands for percent hydrion, um, which is measuring the acidity and the alkalinity in the soil. Some plants like soils acidic, some like them alkaline, some have not a big preference, but most of them do not like the extremes. And so again, you kind of want to know what your pH is, and as we talked about earlier, either live with it and just grow the stuff that is adapted, or move on, you know, if you want to make some amending and go to all that trouble, then you can maybe branch out and try some, some new crops, new plants, etc., or just do it on a small scale. So, it is measured using what we call the pH scale, and one of the things you need to know is that it's a logarithm, 
And so every time you go up or down one number on the pH scale, you're changing by a factor of 10. So a pH of 6 is 10 times more acidic than a 7, but a 5 is 100 times more acidic than a 7 because it had to go two numbers. So it's 10 times 10, which is 100. So when you're making a change, then if you've got a pH of 7, but you really, really want to grow something that needs a pH of 5, you've got to change it 100 times. You know, in other words, that's the amount of stuff you have to put in it, 100 times more than if you're only going just a little bit of a change, okay? Um, so, or 10 times more than if you're only going one number. So it's not really practical to make big changes. You know, if you've got a pH of 8, you know, blueberries are not in your future, okay? <laughs> Unless you really want to go to a lot of trouble with it. There's ways to get around it. Um, so this is our, our basic scale. We kind of go from 0 to 14 on a typical scale. 7 is considered neutral. And basically what we're saying is that the amount of percentage of hydrogen ions is kind of um, <coughs> equal to hydroxyl ions at this point. Um, if you go up above that, we're becoming more alkaline. If we go below, we're becoming more acidic. And most soils are somewhere between 3.5 and 10.5. And this is really unusual, 3.5 and 10.5 is, is also fairly un, unusual. Most of us are somewhere probably between the 5.5, maybe 8.5, something like that, or even 6.5 and 8.5. And happily, most plants really like it in that area too. But if they were original to a bog area that's very acidic, like Sandy Marsh and that uh, belching guy <laughs> would love, then you know they're going to want a pH in this area. If they're from an area that's much more alkaline, maybe out in the desert or something, then they're going to be happier up in this range. So you have to know your plant's preference and then also know what your, your particular pH is. Um, this is probably something that was similar in your book, but it's just saying, you know, Lye is up here at 13, and ammonia is at 11, milk of magnesia, bicarbonate of soda, you know. So if you have excess stomach acid, you know, take a bicarb of soda, and that helps to neutralize it. Milk is kind of neutral. Then you start getting acidic, boric acid, tomatoes, vinegar, lemons, hydrochloric acid. You probably don't want to go beyond that. Um, but as far as soils are concerned, Again, most of them are in this range right here, okay? Or should be, that's kind of what you need. Now, the interesting thing is soil pH affects the nutrient availability and the toxicity. And the other thing we have to keep in mind is that soil organisms prefer a certain pH range as well as our plants do. So we want to keep them happy, we want to keep our plants happy. Um, and we want to make sure we're not putting the soil into some toxic situation. Mm -hmm. So, this is sort of what the array looks like of nutrient availability at the various pH ranges. So if we're in the acidic end, strongly acidic, notice that some of our nutrients are going to become deficient. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium. They become increasingly less available. The sweet spot is right here in the neutral zone where most nutrients are available. And then again, if you get strongly alkaline, we start to lose iron, manganese, and boron briefly, and then it gets into a situation where it might even be toxic, depending on if your plants are sensitive to that. So we have to be careful, and we want to try to hit in the middle so that we hit where most nutrients are available. I like to use this chart sometimes too because what this shows you is that at a high pH, phosphorus and calcium interact with each other to the point where they actually kind of bind up and they're not available. And then at very low pHs, aluminum becomes toxic. If you have a plant that's sensitive to aluminum, and I've heard that things like um, avocados are, you know, they don't really like it that acidic. They would like to be, you know, more in the kind of neutral maybe only slightly acidic range. I think 6 is their favorite pH. So again, I guess there is such a thing as iron toxicity, or perhaps plants like azaleas and blueberries really like a lot of iron, 
and they're adapted for it, and so you know it doesn't bother them. But some other plants, it might be a problem for. Okay, so kind of know your plants, what their typical nutrient deficiencies are, and or toxicities, and manage your pH to stay within the range that they like. Okay, try to wrap up nutrients here a little bit. Um, nitrogen, again, we talked about that as being one of the big three, NPK. This also happens to be the nutrient that is most limiting for plant growth. It's usually the, nu the one nutrient that we need to add in most cases if we want to promote growth, promote a healthy plant. It actually becomes part of the photosynthetic makeup of the leaf, so it's really important for chlorophyll. It becomes a part of the plant protein. So if you want good protein content, you have to have an adequate amount of nitrogen there. It's usually most present in young leaves. And in nature, again, it's typically the limiting nutrient. Now, we also are referring here to carbon-nitrogen ratios. A young blade of grass maybe has a, a ratio of 15 carbon to nitrogen, but an older blade of grass has 80 to 1. So the nitrogen, in relatively speaking, is more abundant in a young blade than it is in an older one. If you don't have enough nitrogen, you'll end up with very slow growth of your plant. It actually has to do with cell division and cell elongation, so the plants will not grow as much as they should. They also will become chlorotic or yellowish in color. And some typical symptoms are just small leaves, overall yellowing. And typically it's the older leaves that lose their green color first. It's considered to be what we refer to as a mobile nutrient. It moves around the plant. So if new growth is happening, it's calling for it. That's where the nitrogen is going to go, and it's going to leave the older roots of, or the older leaves if it has a chance to do that. To help that, you know, like our brain might be calling for blood or whatever, the plant new growth area is calling nitrogen, feed me, feed me, and so it can mobilize the nitrogen to get it to move to that growing point of the plant. So again, depending on the type of plant, you'll see different symptoms of deficiency. Um, I showed tobacco here just to sort of remind us that a lot of research money has gone into tobacco and <laughs> corn and soybeans and not so much on our ornamental plants. Um, so a lot of times we're kind of making ex extrapolations, but you can kind of see some, uh, I think in here maybe the dark green color versus the yellowish color. The yellow here, a little bit smaller, the more lush, vibrant, darker green color that this one um, is showing. Rice, again, some experiments have been done with that, showing you the, the yellowing, the stunting that can happen. Um, turf grass, again, we can have very dense and healthy turf, or if we don't fertilize it enough, we end up with a lot of weeds coming in, a lot of spaces between where weed seeds can get a hold, and the thicker, the denser it is, the more likely it is to actually combat weeds. So. Um, Actually, I guess that's corn, but same principle. Corn and turf grass are very similar in their um, physiology. Okay, so if the plant has enough phosphorus, it's going to make really good root growth. It's going to use water efficiently. It's going to be resistant to cold and disease. And we also usually think of them as being really important for blooming and fruiting. So when we see phosphorus, the middle number on most fertilizing, um, fertilizer bags or whatever, that's usually for flowering and fruiting. And so we would expect a little bit higher number for that. It's limiting in highly weathered soils and in tropical areas. Again, if you don't have it, you're going to have stunted growth. Sometimes the foliage actually gets too dark of green, almost to the point where it's purple and it won't flower and it would delay its maturity. So it has some physiological processes that it's involved in. Now the interesting thing is that we've got a lot of phosphorus in the soil um, because it's weathered minerals that will break that down. So again, depending on what your original parent material is, 
But because of pH problems, a lot of times it becomes unavailable. And occasionally it can actually bind up to the clay particles so tightly that it's not released for plant growth. It's very slow to release in the soil to the point where if you're applying phosphorus, they actually say to put it in before um, you plant your plants and kind of incorporate it deep into the root zone. So it does not move much in the soil and it does not leach downward. Okay? And it actually can become a pollutant. So again, watch your pH range and a plant will only use about 10 to 30 percent of the phosphate fertilizer applied to it. The rest of it's going to end up going into storage, getting locked up somewhere for it. And so it's really important that you incorporate that into the soil, not just sprinkle it on top if you, if you have an issue with phosphorus. Again, it's not always going to show up in our landscape. I'd say nine times out of ten, nitrogen is going to be your issue. Um, but it will reduce bloom, and you can see this is a field in, of canola plants and showing some deficiencies there. Phosphorus deficiency on a coconut palm, on corn, looks like maybe tomatoes, I'm not sure what's, what's up there, let's, yeah tomatoes up at the top, what it can look like. Again, it's, it's really hard sometimes because it does look like that, you know, of course from here it looks like it could be insect damage or something. Um, but again, occasionally it, it could be that. Um, potassium is a little tricky. Um, this actually has to do with ripening, activation of enzymes, growth, and disease resistance. So we want to make sure we have adequate potassium given to our plants. If not, we're going to maybe have problems with water stress, again, a poor root system, and occasionally it will show up as scorching or browning of the tips of leaves. And again, a lot of things can cause scorching and tip burn, so yeah. don't read too much into that. Um, it moves readily in the soil, but not as much as nitrogen. And again, we really think of this as something that helps with resisting infections and disease problems. It may actually um, help a little bit with hardiness, but you want to make sure, again, you don't overdo it. And in some areas, there's adequate potassium in the soil, but not everywhere. So here's a field of soybeans showing that. Okay. Again, we're looking at crops you probably are never going to see, but um, the micronutrients, magnesium is one that's typically not found here or might be deficient in certain plants here that might be a problem. Um, the micronutrients though, if you have problems with that, sometimes addition in fertilizer is good, but you can also do a little bit of foliar spray if that's practical to do on a small scale. This actually is a makeup of um, the chlorophyll molecule and works in you know uptake of other enzymes and other things, processes going on in the plant, so it's real critical for plant growth. Again, less resistance to cold and disease, and then we begin to see a, a particular symptom that we refer to as intervenal chlorosis. And this is where we see dark veins, not natural, in other words, this is not a variegated plant, they're not supposed to be, but we've got dark veins and then the spaces in between are yellowish. That's what we refer to as intervenal chlorosis. Here it is on a Phoenix robellini, some issues with manganese deficiency. And on tomato, again, it shows up that way. Again, micronutrients. Some of them are not well understood. Um, again, too much. You can go into um, some real problems. I'll just kind of leave this for you guys to look at a little bit later. We're kind of running out of time. Um, iron deficiency can be a big one, especially if your pH is too high or you have acid-loving plants like blueberries again. And then sometimes boron deficiency can show up as these deformities and things like roses or cauliflower. I'm not sure I've ever seen that, but you don't want to. <laughs> okay. So again, it's not 
always, you're not going to find a lot of examples of what micronutrient deficiencies look for. But I do want to caution you not to confuse this with what might be phytotoxicity. Maybe an herbicide drift comes in. Sometimes it can mimic that. But what you'll see a lot of times with herbicide problems is you'll see a curling of the foliage. Kind of an unnatural twisting of it can be a problem. So be on the lookout for not just color changes, but also if it's becoming deformed. That could be drift from an herbicide. You can see these ginkgo leaves don't look anything like they're supposed to, okay, or even the sugar maple. There's a great website that, um, and we actually did this in my soil class where we took tomatoes and we produced every element. Oh, huh. And there's a website out there, I don't have the link, but I can give it to Mo where you could look at a tomato plant with each deficiency of each nutrient oh, great. and see the symptoms. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I wanted to point out is mosaic virus is an actual virus that causes a modeling or a color break on the foliage. Again, this is caused by a virus, not by a nutrient deficiency. So it's sometimes helpful to know what do those insect and disease symptoms look like so that you can kind of separate them from nutrient deficiencies. And you also have to know what is overwatering and underwatering. What can that do to a plant? So it gets really tricky. You have to know a little history and be kind of a detective when you're trying to figure these things out. Okay, so that's where we wanted to stop. And it looks like we're like right on time. Awesome. Okay.